Thank you, Leanne. Ezekiel 37 is where we're going to be this morning. Ezekiel chapter 37. We have all year long been looking at the cross from a lot of different angles, a lot of different thought processes. And this morning we're going to talk about risk assessment. Risk assessment. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 1 the prophet Ezekiel writes these words. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, Oh Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones. And say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together. Bone to bone, indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. So he also said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them. And they lived and stood upon their feet in an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own, hand, in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. Life is full of decisions. And whether you realize it or not, every day is filled with decisions full of risk. Some, some of our decisions don't feel like risk because uh, we're so used to uh, the, the uh, pros and cons, the, the, the risk assessment, that it's easy to decide uh, whether we want to do what it is we do. For instance... When you drive a car, there's risk in deciding to get in your car and drive it. And yet, most of us are comfortable with the fact that in spite of the risk, it is worth taking the risk to get in the car and drive to point A to point B, to get to our work, to get to church, to do whatever it is that we have to do. Risk in driving our car is something that we take every day, but it is something that we are used to taking, so it doesn't seem like that great of a risk. Until you're the parent of a teenager who's getting in the car for the first time. Then that risk escalates way back up there. I can remember and each of the four got in the car to drive off for the very first time. And yes, William was probably the most tenuous of the four just because he was the first. But that risk assessment of letting them get in the car and, and, and do certain things. Uh, you do it as a parent. You do it as an individual. I mean, shoot, you do it when you get ready to eat. Yeah, you look at a menu and there's a risk involved. Uh, certain things that, that you might eat might upset your stomach. They might give you, you know, uh, indigestion and different things like that. But you weigh the pros and cons and you say, oh, that's worth the risk. Some of us start businesses. I can remember as a boy when my dad decided to venture out on his own and take the risk of starting his own business as an electrical contractor. It was a huge risk. And then he went even further. If you're from the north, you would understand this a little bit better. In a highly unionized community to go non-union. My dad took the risk of death threats, 
of financial ruin, of getting blackballed, and decided it was worth the risk to start that non-union contractor's job. Uh, sometimes you take the risk <clears throat> of running for political office. <clears throat> the idea that uh, you might fail in that effort is a risk. You have to decide if it's worthy of taking or not compared to the reward and the result that is there. And we could go on and on and on, but uh, we buy a home, we do the same thing. We could just keep going. God takes and has taken the same kind of risk with you and me. He looked at us. He made a risk assessment of us and decided we were worth taking the risk for. Now here's the key. When we make a risk assessment, we look at things as possibilities. This might happen. This could happen. And then there are the unknowns that you have no idea will happen, but could happen still. The difference with God's risk assessment is this. He is all-knowing at all times. So when he took the risk, he already knew what the outcomes were going to be. He already knew where the shortcomings were going to take place. He knew where the rejections were going to happen. He knew where those who he was going to be successful with in redeeming them, in touching them and making them whole as we sang about before we started the service. He knew all that and he still took the risk in each of our lives. He knows how frustrating each of us is and yet he still insisted on taking the risk in our lives. He looked at us like Ezekiel looked at these bones. Now, there are two ways of looking at risk assessment. There's our way, the human way, and then there's God's way. And what I want to do very quickly, this, this might turn out to be a very short but powerful truth that we get in front of us this morning, is that risk assessment can be looked at in human eyes or through the eyes of God. I want you to note Ezekiel's risk assessment at the beginning, verses 1 through 3. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. I want you to notice Ezekiel's assessment of the situation that God had put him in. Where God had placed him in that moment. A valley full of dried up bones. Valley of death. It's interesting. My mind immediately goes to Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. You are are with me in the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> so here, here, God, God brings Ezekiel and says, here's that, that, this valley of bones, risk assessment, okay? And I want you to notice how it's described. I want you to catch some of the languaging here. It was overwhelming to Ezekiel. It was full of dead bones. Just, just as far as he could see. All around him. He said. Were dead bones. Full of dead bones. Then he said. Then he said it was almost as if. It was suffocating. A type of war. Can you imagine walking into an area. And seeing nothing but skulls. And bones laying around. And the destruction of things that are going on. All of that, that, that kind of that, that death and devastation. I don't know how much you've looked at uh, pictures from history of the Holocaust. And the horror of those bodies heaped up. Of bones heaped up from, from the mass murder of the Jews during the Nazi regime. It's horrendous. Disgusting. Hopeless. And that's what, that's what uh, uh, 
Ezekiel saw in that moment, in that effort. Then he, he looked at it and he thought, there's not only no hope, there's no hope here, but this is a worthless journey. If you and I walked into a valley full of bones, what would be the positive we could possibly see? Nothing. Nothing. It would be emotionally devastating to us. Yet, Ezekiel keeps describing, he says it's very dry because there was no signs of life. There was no energy. There seemed to be no future in walking into this valley of bones. And according to what God assessed and described and recognized in verse 11, they've been totally cut off from God. Dead men tell no tales. It's an old pirate saying. Dead men tell no tales. In other words, they don't communicate. They can't share. They can't reach out. So God in verse 11 says this. He says, therefore prophesy and say, uh, that's verse 12, I'm sorry, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed have said, our bones are dry. Our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Cut off from God. Absolutely cut off. Now, folks, I'm going to share with you this morning my belief that as God described it as the nation of Israel in that moment, remember, they had been crushed by Babylon. They had been sent off into exile because of their disobedience. They were going to be in exile for 70 years for the punishment of their sins against God, for turning their back on God. I want you to hear that that's not only just a nation's problem. It's not only a depiction and a picture of maybe what America is about to face as well. I don't know. But I will tell you that it's the picture of what every man and woman, boy and girl faces without Christ. We're dead. We're dead in our trespasses and sin, Isaiah would say in Isaiah chapter 64. We are dead, lifeless, cut off from God without hope, worthless in our existence by ourselves, and in need of something different. Something that man cannot, hear me, man cannot provide the kind of hope that we need. So Ezekiel sees all this and God looks at him in verse 3, speaks to him and says, can these bones live? What would be your medical assessment of this patient, Ezekiel? Dead or a doornail, God? Dead or a doornail? Can they live? Oh God, you know. And here's the key to this. We're going to catch some verses real quick. In the Old Testament, they believe in the resurrection of the individual who was a follower of God. I want you to catch these verses. There's a few of them. We're going to click through them first, quick. 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 21. So it was as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders. They put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. He, feet, he was resurrected. There's another passage I want you to catch. Isaiah 25 and verse 8. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people. He will take away from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. Then we go on in Isaiah to 26 and 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall rise, awake and sing. You who dwell in dust for your dew is like the dew of herbs and the earth shall cast out the dead. And we go on in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake resurrection. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt or damnation. We go on to Hosea chapter 13 and verse 4. Hosea says this, Yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt, and you shall know no God but me, and there is no Savior besides me. Understand, in the Old Testament, they believe in the resurrection of the individual. 
But during the time of Ezekiel, there was no belief that the nation of Israel would ever be resurrected in any form again. It had been totally annihilated. You go back and you look at the history of what Nebuchadnezzar did to a, a kingdom that, that uh, uh, he wiped out. And he didn't just defeat them. He eliminated them completely. Eliminated them completely. Now, there's, there's the other side of this as well. You see, the theology of life is the theology of what God believes about life as well. They believed in the individual. But what's, what's interesting is, is that while in the Old Testament they saw resurrection and eternal life as otherworldly, as something in a man's future, as something that was uh, never a part of the present time in life, although in rare occasions if something unique might occur, there was also the opportunity to recognize present potential in all things. Here's what I want us to begin to grasp. As we begin to allow God to work in our lives, there is an understanding in our lives of present potential. God looked at those bones and said, I see hope. I see opportunity. I see the chance to do something miraculous through these dead bones. And we be saying, what? God, have you lost your mind? What are you thinking? These are dead bones. And God says, I see something that no one else can see. I see opportunity to bring glory to my name. When no man's activity can succeed, I see my opportunity to overwhelmingly respond. See, the message of hope is intended for the most hopeless of situations. When you have no hope, that's exactly where God wants you. Is in the moment of hopelessness, where you have nowhere else to turn, where there seems like there's no opportunity to come out alive. God says, I've got a way. I've got a way to get you out of this mess alive. I love those kind of thrillers. Yeah, it's amazing. You watch TV shows, you know, you, you watch movies and stuff like that, and you think, oh, there's no way they're going to get out of this one. Well, you know, if it's especially if it's a TV series and that's the main star, 99.9% .9 of the time, they got to get out of that some way or another. Yeah, it's just going to happen. So you're like, ah, no sweat. What really is the real kicker and the ones that I really tend to enjoy is when they throw you the curveball and the heroine or hero doesn't get out of it. You know, those are the ones, oh, I didn't see that one coming. Why? Because Hollywood is able to set up a scenario that you didn't see coming and get that person out of life. Here's the problem. That's Hollywood. It's make-believe. This is reality. We have no hope in ourselves, with mankind. We have no opportunity for uh, man to be able to generate enough to bring us back to life. Now, you know, there's some really unique things happening in science these days. It's still short of God. It's still short of God. And I want you to catch uh, what, what Ezekiel goes on to say. As he looks, beginning in verse 7, where, where he says, So I prophesied as I was commanded. Here's where you begin to experience the potential that God intends. I want you to prophesy to those bones. All right? I'm going to do it, God. Do you really think Ezekiel was just totally full of faith? I think he's like, I've never been asked to preach to bones before. Y'all look a little bit better than skeletons out there this morning. I'm going to tell you, I've never been asked to preach to bones this morning. But Ezekiel had a congregation full of bones. And as far as I can tell, his church was full. And it was full of bones. Personally, I'll take the empty pews with some live clients, okay, over a church full of dead bones. 
But that's what Ezekiel had. And here's what Ezekiel did. He prophesied and he did what God said. And all of a sudden, he began to hear some clacking and clicking. And he started to hear some noise and all kinds of things happening. And all of a sudden, just like out of a real creepy movie, all of a sudden, the bones pop up. Lifeless, but they pop up. And then God says, all right, now I want you to preach to the four winds and ask the spirit of the winds to come into them. This is right out of one of those horror flicks I used to be um, uh, off limits to me to watch when I was a kid type thing, you know. And so here's what Ezekiel does. He obeys again. And the potential comes, becomes reality in the ministry of Ezekiel. That's what you and I the dead bones come to life. I'm going to tell you, what amazes me is that, that uh, I really, really did not correlate the music in my thought process with the message this morning. But, but I heard Tony playing. He touched me over here, and I love that song. But, but then um, uh, uh, Janie and Martha and Addison were sitting here, and we, I was just, I was cutting up a little bit. And then, then Addison said, I've never heard it before. So I started saying, you know me, I just, I just kind of hammed it up a little bit. And then, and then I just, I just couldn't, I just like, you know, we need to sing this song. So that's what I did up here. And you think about it, he touched me and he made me whole. I was that bag full of bones. And he touched me. He put muscle on me. By the way, that's what Sanu is. I don't know why we can't get the modern day muscle cartilage out. You know, that's what sinew is. It's your muscle and your cartilage. Okay? He put muscle on me. He's put flesh on me. I'm alive and kicking, but it's not my old body that creaks. Like we were talking about in the ladies' Sunday school class this morning. We don't bend over like we used to. You know? And then, you know, they tell you, well, don't bend over anymore and save your back. So they tell you to learn to squat. Then your knees give out so you can't squat anymore, you know. But I'm here to tell you, as bad as my bones may creep, as achy as my muscles might be at any one point in time, he touched me, he made me whole, and my spirit is as alive as a teenage kid. He did that yesterday. Yeah. I'm telling you. What a blessing that God has done in our lives when we find Jesus. Amen. Then, then you've, got, you've got our worship team up here singing, I've been changed, redeemed, forgiven. Holy cow, do we not get it that we were as hopeless as a bag of bones and God took a risk and sent Jesus on the cross to die for us because he saw potential in each and every one of us and those who don't know him yet. Risk assessment. You were a risk. Folks that walked through that door yesterday, some didn't look so good. To be honest, some of them didn't smell so good. Jesus took the risk and died for them too. Our risk assessment tells us this. The intentions of the Savior come to this, this point in fact in the last three verses. Individual resurrections make up national restoration. Hear me. Individual resurrections lead to national restoration. I have said for, I guess, Lee, and probably the entire 30 years we've been, close to 30 years we've been married, the, the, minute, the time I've been in ministry, you cannot and will not change this nation with an election, with hope in an individual, with a set of laws, or with a mandate. You will change this nation one soul at a time through Jesus Christ. Period. 
Anything short of that is a worthless effort. We didn't change Central South Carolina yesterday because we fed over 400 souls with some food. If that's all we were out to do was to try and change them through a hot meal, we blew it. We blew it. Our intent ought to be to not just warm their stomach, but to fill their soul with the love of Jesus Christ. To do everything we can to draw them into Christ with his love. You say, well, Tony, if you believe that, why'd you run for political office? Because we're still supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to still try and be an influence and an impactor wherever God puts us. I guess I did enough salt and enlightening where I was. Now, that's not theologically pretty pretty sound. It's terrible grammar. But I guess I, I did what I was supposed to do and I'm done in that realm. So yesterday, we fed people. Is that what we're supposed to do tomorrow? No. Don't think so. And uh, I've decided that I rarely do this. I will change the marquee this afternoon so that folks don't think we're going to do this again next Saturday. All right? All right? Don't want, don't want that confusion happening. Uh, be a problem. We gave the, the rest of the turkey and fixings to uh, the helping hands to feed those kids for a while. Risk assessment. Individual resurrections lead to national restoration. Individual resurrections result in a new relationship with God. Listen to this in verse 13. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves O oh, my people and brought you up from your graves individual resurrections result in God's watch care blessing and his own glorification listen to this I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land then you shall know that I the Lord have spoken it and performed it says the Lord I want, I, I want you to know how much I care for you so I'm going to identify myself. I'm not going to be anonymous. I want to love you and take care of you, God says. There's the hope to the hopeless. There's the hope that you and I, maybe we received it and understood it when we were children. Maybe we've forgotten how rickety our spiritual bones were. But I want us to catch this last point. And just, just grasp it one more time. God saw us. Me. You. As a risk. And he took it. He took it. Not every soul he took a risk on. Will spend eternity with him in heaven. He recognizes that, that there's going to be some failure in that risk. It's not God's. It's man's refusal. But there's also the benefit of each and every soul that comes to know him as Lord and Savior. That's why I say it doesn't matter who's not here. It always matters who is here message is intended for you to hear. The activity is intended for you to participate in. That person to participate in. That person to receive the blessing. Not the person who isn't. Risk assessment. What are you willing to risk for eternity? Jesus said, whoever is willing to lose his own life, risk it, will gain his soul. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are, for the blessings of Jesus Christ, for your love, your mercy, and grace. I pray that you would empower us. Thank you for the risk that has been taken in this fellowship from time to time over the years. Lord, help us to be more bold. 